The MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi has been a solid motherboard and has served my test bench well. I've used it to test out various configurations along with benchmarking numerous games and hardware. Now MSI has released a new version of this board, the Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2. And what I wanted to take a look at was to see the kinds of improvements they've made to it and discuss if it's a viable option if you're in the market for building yourself a gaming PC. Let's get into it. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey what is going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today we're going to be checking out the MSI Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi Max 2 motherboard. This motherboard is actually a refresh of a refresh as MSI has four different variants of this board. There's the Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi which I have been using for quite some time now in my test bench, then once the Intel 14th Gen Raptor Lake refresh hit the market, MSI had released the Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi 2 to coincide with the new series. Now they've got the Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 and there are a number of improvements they've made to this revision in regards to its specifications, features, and some overclocking support. More specifically, memory overclocking. Now you guys know me, on my channel, DDR5 memory overclocking is an area we have delved into before, and let me tell you, it's been quite the interesting roller coaster of a journey. On MSI's product page, one of the main highlights of this motherboard is the memory overclocking, and they advertise 7800 mega transfers, so that is something I'll be very much looking forward to testing out, as some of you may know, trying to achieve high DDR5 speeds on a 4 dim board can be quite difficult. But we'll cross that bridge once we get there and check out some of the board's other features as we get further along this review. To start off, I just wanted to quickly do an unboxing of the motherboard to show you guys what you get inside the box. Right on top of the motherboard, we have the antenna for the motherboard's built in wireless connectivity for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Then we've got the motherboard which comes wrapped in an anti-ESD bag, and something I mentioned last time was how I felt like they could have at least included some packing foam at least around the motherboard to ensure safer transit, especially for a higher end option like this one. At the bottom of the box we have some SATA cables, an RGB extension cable, M.2 screws. Now here's what's really cool, along with this motherboard you get MSI's USB 4 power delivery expansion card, and we're going to be taking a look at this a bit more later on. Aside from that, you do also get some cable management labels which come in handy when doing things like, you know, cable management. Now let's move on and take a look at the motherboard itself. When it comes to aesthetics, we won't be spending too much time here because as you can see, the Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 looks very similar to the original Carbon Wi-Fi. It continues and keeps that same theme where you get a sober and sleeker look as opposed to a flashy one, which is typically the look I prefer. I find neutral motherboards like this one make it much easier to blend in into any kind of build. However, if there was one major change they did make with this motherboard, it was with the IO cover, which now has RGB LEDs, whereas on the older version, Version, the MSI Dragon logo is what illuminated. Another thing I mentioned last time was I was hoping they'd have a white version of this board as that would make it look even be better with a white PCB. So I am a bit sad they didn't do that with this updated and more premium version. In any case, the black and gray carbon theme they have going on here st is still pretty nice. In regards to features, specifications, and connectivity, a lot of that you'll find is the same as its predecessor, the original carbon Wi-Fi, but that's also alright because the board already came loaded with plenty of bells and whistles but they have also made some improvements in various areas. Now, when it comes to power delivery, the Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 carries over the same configuration, and there's nothing wrong with that at all because it's essentially an overkill solution where the average user would get nowhere close to even taxing it. It's got a 19 plus 1 plus 1 power phase design. The MOSFETs are rated for up to 105 amps. You also get two 8-pin power connectors, which will give your CPU more power headroom should you need it. I'd say even if you were diving into extreme overclocking, you wouldn't be able to push the VRMs to their limit. The VRMs do have plenty of robust cooling on them with an extended heat pipe, similar to the Carbon Wi-Fi. From all the benchmarking and testing I've done, VRM temperatures have never been an issue with that board, so I assume temps should not be a problem with this board as well. Moving on to the memory configuration, here we've got four DDR5 memory DIMM slots, which will allow the user to install up to a 256GB kit. Oh, and while that large capacity is great, if you're someone who's going to be using this board for a production PC, it's beneficial. However, that much capacity is isn't necessary for a gaming build like this. With that said, since MSI has two variants of this board, a non-max and now this max version, I think it would have been awesome if they had made this version a 2 dim board, as that would have helped for those who are looking to really push their memory speeds, but like I said, we're going to be doing some testing with this board to see what it's really capable of, and who knows, maybe it might surprise us. Around the memory dim slots, there are a variety of headers here, three of them are for your fans, and one is a dedicated pump fan header, which can supply up to 3 amps, and that will be handy if you're using a water cooler. 
We've also got an LED debug display and these are always beneficial to have because they display a code which the user can reference from the manual and find out what's wrong with their system if it doesn't post. Along with that it can double down as a CPU temperature display so that's pretty convenient. Around the 24 pin ATX power connector we have a 20 gigabit USB-C and a 5 gigabit per second USB 3 front panel connector. And what I really like is the placement here. I think it's kind of underrated that they did this. It's a feature that I think all manufacturers should follow is that they have the USB 3 header placed on the side instead of facing upwards as this can make cable management really easy as that kind of connector is really bulky and quite stiff. I hate it when the motherboard manufacturers put it at the bottom of the board. Besides the USB 3 header, we have 6 SATA ports for your hard drives and SATA based SSDs, and I find today 6 SATA ports should be plenty, since prices on M.2 drives are basically in the same range and folks are opting to use those instead of, you know, your 2.5 or 3.5 drives. Moving around to the bottom, we have a plethora of headers that will control a variety of other stuff, like more fan headers. This board has a total of seven fan headers, including the pump header, so if you're going to be doing a build in a case which accommodates lots of fans, and considering how everyone is using a Lee and Lee 011 clone these days, then they'll come in handy. You've also got different types of RGB and ARGB headers, which is great because for some reason, the manufacturers can't agree on one standard. Then you have more USB headers, your front panel connectors, HD audio. Since we just mentioned audio, I'll also highlight that this board is using the Realtek ALC4080 audio chip. It supports 8 channel 7.1 HD audio and MSI have incorporated a headphone amplifier called Audio Boost 5. It's basically the same exact audio implementation that the original Carbon Wi-Fi uses, which is great because from my testing it performed absolutely fine. I'm someone who can be sensitive when my audio sounds off due to interference or just not enough punchiness and I hadn't experienced anything like that with the ALC4080. Moving around to the rear we have the IO with an integrated shield which is nice and connectivity wise it's mostly the same but MSI have made some improvements here with the Carbon Wi-Fi Max 2. This version has been upgraded to use Wi-Fi 7 so if you got a new wireless router that also supports this new standard then this board will be able to take advantage of the higher bandwidth. Along with that you get Bluetooth 5.4 so higher bandwidth, better range and lower latency. The LAN port also has been updated to a 5 gigabit port as opposed to a 2.5 gigabit port. I wish we could take advantage of those kinds of speeds here in Canada but our ISPs are still very stingy and there are lots of areas where even 1 gigabit isn't available but I digress. Moving on we've got two USB-C ports, one is a 10 gigabit port and the other is a 20 gig port. We've also got six USB type A 10 gig ports and two USB type A 5 gigabit ports. We also have an HDMI 2.1 port where if you want to utilize the integrated graphics to connect it additional monitors that will come in handy. And then over on the left hand side we've got some quick access BIOS buttons. One is used to clear your CMOS which is useful for when you're overclocking and your overclock settings fail. One is a BIOS flashback button which will allow you to flash the board's BIOS without actually having the CPU installed which is great for new releases. And a smart button which can be used for programming things like your RGB or auto applying an overclock profile. As for expansion we have one PCIe 5.0 x16 slot that has been reinforced with what MSI calls steel armor. Basically, it's metal shielding around the slot which will help with durability and prevent the slot from bending from the heavy weight of a graphics card such as an RTX 4090. Along with that, we have another X16 slot. This one uses the PCIe 4.0 standard and then there's a small PCIe 3.0 X1 slot. But if you've got a large 3-slot GPU, which I'm sure most users who buy this board will have, then it'll be inac inaccessible, so just be mindful of that. So just like with the original Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi, the Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 comes with 5 M.2 slots. One of those is a Gen 5 M.2 slot, which is great because now there are Gen 5 SSDs on the market, and we have recently taken a look at a Gen 5 NVMe SSD, which was also from MSI, and it was an absolute monster when it comes to transfer speeds. I'll have a link to that video in the description if you want to check it out but with this board you'd be able to take advantage of those fast gen 5 drives that are hitting the market now the one thing you do have to be careful about is that once you have a drive installed in the gen 5 slot it does cut the bandwidth of the pcie x16 5.0 slot to x8 but i've tested this with my 4090 and it's a non-issue but having five m.2 slots is great since m.2 drives are so abundant and cheap these days i find consumers are opting to use those instead they're much more easier to manage and you don't have to worry about 
placing drives in the back of your system, and then there's zero cable management involved. MSI's Easy Clip feature also makes installing the drives very easy, so you don't have to worry about messing around with tiny screws or losing them. I was, however, a little bit disappointed that they didn't incorporate some sort of easy latch feature for the graphics card slot, because if you have something set up with a bulky GPU and you're using a tower cooler, then good luck trying to stick your fingers down there to unlatch the GPU. An easy latch slot or button on the side would have been super helpful here. That overall covers everything I wanted to talk about the board itself. Like I said, there weren't too many drastic changes they made here apart from some upgrades on connectivity standards. Let's move on to the BIOS and the UEFI, and if you've used an MSI motherboard over the last few years, then this layout will look quite familiar to you. I've used motherboards from all the various manufacturers and vendors, and I personally find MSI's layout to be the best. Everything is categorized logically, with some boards from other manufacturers I found I'd be jumping into various menus when it came to just tuning the CPU, whereas with MSI, all the CPU tuning options are found in one place. So it's stuff like this that the end user can really appreciate as it makes our lives easier. While testing out this board, I thought it'd be best to make sure I installed the latest BIOS, and what I was happy to see was that MSI had changed the cooler tuning menu uh, to one that actually makes sense for the user to know which profile to actually apply that abides by the stock guidelines. Because before, it'd just say box cooler, tower cooler, and water cooler, but for those who weren't in the know and they would just stick water cooler because a lot of people are using AIOs but they'd essentially be running with unlimited power limits which has been one of the main contributors to the whole fiasco Intel has gone through recently with users reporting instability. So it was misleading before and with this profile the user now can know which one to apply which is the stock profile that follows the uh, guidelines with the power limits. Aside from that, everything is basically the same as what you already have with the original Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi. You have options to overclock and tune your CPU, you can mess around with frequency multipliers for P cores, E cores, and ring, you can disable your E cores, you can tune your memory and adjust its timings, there are sections for the voltage control, you can also control all the fan headers right from the BIOS instead of having to use a software within Windows, which I really like. And what I also really like is how with MSI's boards, you have full control of every single header. Header. On my ASUS Encore board, I was actually shocked to find that some of the head headers were just uncontrollable and were always running at 100%, which therefore led to me having to use splitters, which was kind of an inconvenience. So overall, the UEFI is quite extensive and has options to tweak every aspect of your system, which is great if you're a hardware enthusiast who does like to tune their system. Now, one of the things I said I was looking forward to testing with the board was memory overclocking, and I was expecting to hopefully find some pleasant results but unfortunately it didn't turn out the way I had expected and my overclocking journey was kind of short-lived. So on my original Z790 carbon Wi-Fi it wouldn't even post past 7600 mega transfers. This board can post with the memory running at 7800 mega transfers but I also tried 8000 mega transfers and unfortunately it was a no-go. Furthermore while 7800 could post and boot into Windows uh, I just couldn't stabilize it, as it would error out within a couple of seconds. Doesn't matter what kind of voltage it is I tried, it just wouldn't work out. And then I tried 7600, and I couldn't get that to stabilize either, but I could get further into the memory stress test than 7800. So if I had some more time in my hands, I think I could get it to work as I did on the original Carbon Wi-Fi. The thing is with DDR5 man, you could have the same kit or a variation of a motherboard and the voltages you need can just change so drastically. This is why there really isn't any sort of like proper overclocking guide when it comes to DDR5. The results are so wildly different. It's just a lot. It's just basically you and a lot of guess and check. 74 466 mega transfers was easy to dial in, but I'm kind of disappointed that I couldn't do 7800 stable as it shows on their website that they're advertising. Now, I'm not going to zonk the board for that. The CPU's IMC could very well just be incapable of handling that frequency, but this is why I was hoping they'd make some kind of a 2 dim version of this board, as it would have made it a lot more less stressful on the CPU's IMC. Nonetheless, most people buying DDR5 are running kits at or below 7000 anyways, so this board will serve the vast majority of them just fine. If I get some more time on my hands, I'll try to see if I can source one of those QVL kits and see if that'll truly work out of the box. 
Now here's the board with it installed on the test bench and I gotta say the RGB on the IO cover looks pretty nice so if you are a fan of having lighting in your case then this board will blend in well and adds a nice touch overall. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the included USB 4 PD 100 watt expansion card. Now this device is really cool because it gives you two 40 gigabit per second USB ports one of which supports 100 watt fast charging and it also has two display ports. Essentially you can leverage this card so you can connect multiple displays from keyboards, audio equipment, monitors, and more. I can see this being very useful for someone who's looking at setting up streaming equipment with multiple cameras. With the faster transfer speeds, it can also be useful if you've got external NVMEs. But one thing you do have to be mindful of is that when you have a large GPU like the 4090, and this one here is also from MSI, then you'll be somewhat limited on where you can install this add-in card. And even if you do, it's going to be obstructing airflow for the graphics card, so just be mindful of that. Well, that just about covers everything I wanted to talk about for my review of MSI Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 motherboard. It steps up in some areas which I think were definitely needed compared to the competition, but it still retains all those same specifications and positive quality of life features that were present on the original board. If you are interested in picking one up, I'll have affiliate links for it down below in the video description. But for now, that's going to do it for this one. We'll touch base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.